we will invite our first team of the day to present their paper titled Principles for Scaling Our Portfolio Price Optimization Across Categories. Good morning, everyone. So today I'll be talking about the 10 principles that will help you scale up portfolio pricing research across categories. These are universal principles across categories, and they form the foundation for automating this field of research, which can otherwise get very complex and category specific. But before getting into this, let us first understand that why do we need this? Well, the reason being that the delay in taking the right pricing decisions can actually drain out profits, and it can drain out at speed in digital age. Like the diagram that you see here basically shows that had the decision been taken a couple of weeks before, then extra profits could have actually been blocked. So for market researchers to help businesses make faster decisions at scale, it requires automation of portfolio price optimization frameworks and its generalizability across categories. And to forecast market response with accuracy, requires that we have a strong analytical foundation that considers the evolving market realities. So we first begin with the principles related to capturing market reality in terms of irregular prices, psychological price points, tipping points, and market operating prices. Now in real market, the amount of price change that businesses can absorb usually differs by SKUs. So be it the pack size in FMCG, or be it the model variance in non-FMCG, or value versus premium brands in any category. Then there are realities like psychological price points and market operating prices, which should ideally be tested with the consumers in the survey itself. So the generalizable solution here would be something which can cover both the regular and the irregular price gaps. And for this, it is best to utilize the alternative specific price attributes in discrete design choice and models. Now coming to our second principle, the nonlinear response to price change is reality, especially when it comes to tipping points. And what we have seen is that it is better to group the SKUs with similar responses instead of estimating the individual curves. This will help you reduce the total number of estimates and it works really well, even with lesser sample. Next up, we cover principles related to capturing market reality in terms of display of products and consumer interaction. Now, when it comes to surveys, the best practice is to replicate how purchases are being made in real life. And in reality, it is true that there are a large number of products on shelves, and everybody does some kind of a mental shortlisting when they are making purchases. So adaptive designs is definitely the way to go. And for replicating survey interface close to reality, if you just have these four templates which are shown here, the traditional trade template, the modern trade template, e-commerce, and the showroom experience template, if you have just these four, it would suffice for majority of the cases. Now coming to our next principle. Now in market, some general pricing rules, they apply across categories. Like larger FMCG packs are never going to be cheaper than their smaller ones. And similar hierarchy holds for the feature-rich automotive variants or the service-rich subscription packages. And this hierarchy also applies with discounts and promotions. So in order to scale up the solution, the idea is to create a repository of these adaptive designs and dynamically replace the prohibited combinations with the unprohibited ones. So you should always keep the default prohibitions and add on any study-specific prohibitions if it's required. Next, we'll cover principles related to improving the accuracy of forecasts. Now, what we have seen across categories is that consumers who recall the price being uh, you know, uh, lower than what it is in market, and those who are exactly aware of the prices are actually more sensitive to price changes than the ones who recall the price being higher than the actual price. So if you include the information on price recall and forecasting model, it will actually help you improve the forecasts. Now our sixth and the seventh principle basically relate to new products. 
It's very common across categories to test for new products in portfolio pricing research, and it's equally common to overestimate their preferences. So to correct for this overestimation and also to more accurately predict the impact of cannibalization, the answer is to use the HB draws, which is the hierarchical Bayesian draws method for simulation rather than the regular share of preference. And you can also use the top end method if the computation gets really heavy for you. And if you use these optimizer algorithms which have turf capabilities, it will help you get a lot of actionable insights on new launches. Next up, we cover principles related to bringing the forecasts closer to reality. Now in every category, availability or distribution impacts sales, and it is usually incorporated in all the market forecasts. What we believe is that every consumer has their own effective distribution, because some of them are willing to make an extra effort to find their favorite product, and also different areas of a city are accessible to the same person. So if you build this into your forecasting model, it will align the results closer with real life. Now coming to our next principle, which is the ninth one. So what we have seen is that including the actual behavior as inputs in forecasting model also really helps. Like if you include the recent purchase data in FMCG and consumer's budget range for the large ticket items, it will help you get results closer to reality. Now coming to our last principle, and this is more to do for the market leaders and especially if you are interested in the category volumes. Because sometimes what happens is that the price changes can actually impact the category volume per se, especially if you're a market leader. And what we have seen is that in surveys, it is very difficult for the consumers to answer how their consumption will change in the long term if you just ask them directly in the survey. So in our experience, the change in category size should be estimated by fusing the choice data with the long-term behavioral data to get your results closer to reality. So those were our principles and now coming to the implications and limitations. So this particular framework has basically helped us reduce our delivery time to about one third for the standard pricing problems and about two third for the advanced business pricing problems. The limitation is that what we have shown you here is a very good base forecasting model which is applicable across categories. But if there is something which is too category specific, you may want to do some add-on interventions on top of it. So to summarize what we have shared with you today are the 10 foundational principles to automate and scale up price and portfolio solutions which are more accurate and will help you forecast closer to real life. Thank you so much. Um, now we'll open the floor for the Q&A session. So please feel, uh, please use the web platform and scan the QR code to ask any questions that you want to the author of this paper. Thanks. Uh, Surbeet, we have one question here. As markets evolve and new categories emerge, how adaptable are the core principles to future innovations in product portfolios? Can the automated framework anticipate shifts or does it require manual updates to remain relevant? Yeah, so, uh, so see, when we talk about the modeling principles, they would pretty much hold the way it is. Uh, when we talk about new categories, it would be predominantly related to how the display is being done or how consumers purchase it in real life. So as and when new categories emerge, like we had the e-commerce template coming in with the, uh, with the advent of uh, digital commerce, similarly, if there is any other new category which comes in, then that can be added as a template as the, as the thing. And yeah, that's how we'll pretty much handle that. There's another one. Uh, what safeguards or validation mechanisms are in place to ensure that the automation delivers accurate and meaningful insights across such a diverse range of categories without sacrificing depth or precision in the research insights? Yeah, so validation, the best thing is to actually test out that, you know, what happens in real market uh, versus what we have forecasted. So we have a regular framework in place where we keep validating, uh, you know, on a regular basis. And if there are any, uh, you know, watch outs, then we would kind of, you know, do the R&D and then improve upon the framework again. That's how we handle that. Yeah. There's another one. Sure. Which are the top two categories in which you applied these principles? 
Yeah, so it's basically, uh, you know, the amount of briefs that you would get, and uh, they mainly happen to be from the FMCG and the non-FMCG segment. So uh, that's, that's the reason we would have, I think, more cases around that. It's simply to do with, you know, the kind of briefs or the company sizes that exist in the market. And one last one. In times of inflation and deflation, how long are the results valid for? Uh, so see, until and unless there are, uh, you know, there's a major disruption in the market, we would say that, you know, close to about a year or so, you should be good enough. Until and unless the market changes drastically, uh, because then in that case, anyway, you will need to redo your survey and, you know, uh, reevaluate your own strategies as well. Thank you so much. That's Thank you so much. Thank you.